This is a story which begins more than 400 years ago. It's about buried treasure and the trouble it can bring you. It's about a mystery nobleman and a lost jewel. In Tudor times, a wealthy gentleman is out riding through the prime hunting land around Farnham in Surrey. As he heads into the woods, he loses his hat. A search through the undergrowth and he finds it. But he leaves behind a precious gold and sapphire hat pin. Four centuries later, in what's now a public park, Ian Fletcher finds the lost jewel with his metal detector. The treasure will be valued at £35,000. If I'd known what was going to happen to me from finding it, I would never have set foot in Farnham Park. Blackpool, Ian's hometown. It's here he developed his passion for metal detecting. Here too, he runs a struggling sewing machine business with his wife, Julie. Your hobby changed everything for you? Yes, it did. I found that piece of British history and it's ruined my life, it's become the bane of my life. Ian did the honest thing. He handed the jewel in to the local coroner, as you're supposed to. The coroner allowed him to keep it and seek a reward. But then the local council stepped in, claiming the jewel was theirs. They sued Ian for it and won. He had to pay their legal bill plus his own. We've got to sell the house. Really, we've no pension now. It leaves us with nothing to show for 30 years of work. So the council take you to court, you win the first case, you lose the appeal. What sort of costs has that left you with? It's left us with, in total, £35,000, plus the ongoing interest to Waverley Borough Council. Let me get this straight. They're actually charging you interest on this. So this is mounting up and mounting up? It's mounting up at roughly £1,200 per year. This is their invoice for this month's interest. I presume if we default on payment, then they would auction the house from under us. So what would you like them to do, the council? I would like to see some compassion from them, some humanity, where they could at least drop the interest off. That, well, that would be the very least thing they could do. It's the interest that's killing me. It's back to Farnham Park to investigate Ian's case. Waverley Council claim metal detecting causes damage, but they still allow concerts and fairs here, ball games too. When you hear that it's a park, you think, well, maybe flower beds, manicured lawns, things like that, but, I mean, this is basically a cow field, isn't it? Yeah, this is a very rough cow pasture. It's very rutted, very open countryside. So you were down here on holiday, your brother's house over there. Yep. And you decided to do some metal detecting, so I where did you Joe? go? Right, come on, Joe, I'll show you. So the scene of the crime is through here? Yes, this is the, the gold bullion robbery. <laughs> Just trying to work <laughs> out how, I got my wellies. how I got in. Right, this, this was definitely the this is spot. This spot? Yeah. Somewhere in here? Right, yep. Yeah. This was like the magic moment. I'd have located, pinpointed the spot. Chung in the trial goals, and it, it was quite amazing, because there was the jewel, and it was staring me right in the eye. And I, you, see, you see this cornflower of gold, and, the, and I just thought, wow, look at that, you know? And it, it's like 20 years of detecting has just come to fruition. The council say they had to sue Ian to get a legal ban on detecting in the park and stop what they claim would be a surge of people damaging the land. When you look at this beautiful old, and it is an old park, you can imagine that there could still be a lot of old jewels slowly sinking down. And they're not going to be found now because of this ban, are they? Because no. people aren't allowed to go looking for them. Yeah, our heritage will sink with them. So the council say detecting damages the land. 
time to test their claim. With the help of some Blackpool school kids and leading soil expert, Bob Taylor. Now you're a turf grass agronomist. You work for the Sports Turf Institute and you've done a report looking at the relative damage caused by metal detecting and other games, ball games, things like that. What did you find? All of the evidence points to it's, it's, it's less damaging than a casual game of soccer, casual game of rugby, cricket. Certainly if the ground conditions were unfavourable, uh, then certainly metal detecting would be a far more acceptable pursuit. So anyone who thinks that these metal detectors are digging great big holes, that's not true. In fact, they're going down, what, about that far? The majority of objects tend to be found within around 50 millimetres or so, sometimes down to around 150 millimetres. And so it's not a case of digging great big holes, certainly not. It's this case of just taking off the turf, laying it to one side, finding the object and then replacing the turf uh, sensibly and carefully. Waverley Council claim they're preserving history. We decide to make a bit of history ourselves by trying to trace the jewel's original owner. We begin at Farnham Castle. Who better to help us than historian Robin Bush of the Channel 4 Time Team? So this is the castle keep, the, the, the last line of defence for when the place was under attack. And we think this was built in 1138 by, by Henry of Blois. So Farnham, with its castle, it's traditionally been a hugely important town. Well, of course, you're talking here about one of six great castles or palaces that the bishops of Winchester had. And this was where they came for recreation. Now, this is an expensive jewel that you found, isn't it? it? How much is it worth? 35,000 pounds. 35,000 pounds. 35,000 pounds. And what do, you, what do you think it is? Right, my first impression, when I first saw it, Robin, was yeah. that it could have been a cloak pin. Uh-huh. What do you think about that? Well, I've looked at pictures of it, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the context seems to indicate that if it is, as the experts say, uh, early 16th century, yeah. then it's most likely to be some kind of, of hat pin or hat brooch. Right. Something that was worn for ornament in, uh, in this case, a Tudor hat. Right. Because you've long had a hunch as to who this might belong to, haven't you? Yes. Uh, I always thought that because the hunting grounds belong to the Bishop of Winchester, mm -hmm. that just possibly it might have been his. What do you think, Robin? <laughs> well, if you look at the Tudor portraits of not only bishops, but also some of the king's principal ministers, mm -hmm. they dress terribly, terribly plainly. And whenever you see them in a hat, uh, if it, uh, we think it is a hat pin, mm -hmm. um, it's this little tricorn of a, of a, a dark black hat with mm -hmm. no adornment whatsoever. So I think we've got to look at some other possibility for the kind of person who might have lost that jewel out there. You're wrong, but it's not over yet. No, no, <laughs> I'll, I'll, no. I'm wrong, but uh, I'm going to leave it to this man. <laughs> While Robin begins his research, we set up base in Ian's brother's house. Here we turn up some gems about the local council. It is quite clear that these people were very anti-metal detecting long before you came on the scene, weren't they? I mean, this letter here, 1979, they were writing to the government saying, we want to ban metal detecting, and the government say, no. So they failed. Joe, the government got it right. Yeah, right. These people then use me to get what they wanted. I've got something here that you won't have seen. This is a confidential council report on whether they should reward you or sue you for finding the jewel. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion they reached was that if they rewarded you, it would be a reward for stolen property. Those are their words. What? How, how do you mean stolen property? How can it be stolen property? Well, I mean... From where have they stolen it? Effectively, they're calling you a thief, aren't they? How does that make you but feel? How can I be a thief? This hurts. It hurts very much, yes. I find it absolutely horrendous that the, the, the very person that's brought them, what, what I brought them, they can call me a thief. But if you'd known that they were talking in terms of stolen property from the outset... I'd would have that, would that... all stolen it. I would have pinched it, I'd have taken it back to Blackpool. You're an honest man, you pride yourself on that. But I've spent my life trying to be honest and doing the honest thing. And then they actually slander you like this, I think it's scandalous. Stop there again. 
When we design our high-performance aircraft, the starting point is the pilot. First, we give him a seat that allows him to feel every movement of the aircraft. We design a cockpit that puts everything instinctively at his fingertips. Then, we place him as close to the center of gravity as possible. Finally, we surround him with a strong aerodynamic body. Exactly the same way as we build our cars. The new 4-in-1 multi-sander from Black & Decker. One, it's a random orbital sander. Two, turn the key and it's a finishing sander. Three, it's a detail sander. And four, it's a really clever contour sander. The versatile 4-in-1 multi-sander, only from Black & Decker. While Waverley Council branded Ian Fletcher a thief, other detecting enthusiasts have been well rewarded for their discoveries. Under the old law of treasure trove, items buried deliberately belong to the Crown. Many are in the British Museum and the state has paid the finders the full market value. But Ian's jewel, now in Farnham Museum, was lost accidentally. So the treasure trove reward scheme did not apply. This is a, where every metal detectorist wants to come because the, the type of things that he's looking for, this place is laden with them. And this is what it's about, getting it on display here and getting your reward, but getting it on display here, isn't it? Yes. So, oh, oh, this is the Hoxton Hoard here. This yeah. is the big one, isn't it? Look at that. Just look at that. So, Mr Eric Laws makes this magnificent find with his metal detector, gets his name up in lights in the British Museum and he gets a reward of one and a half million quid. Well, he would feel like a million dollars when he found it. It would be pouring out of him. And some, you know, any one of these items that sort of jumped out of the ground, you'd be, you think, oh my God, Eureka, look at this. The British Museum are not shy about saying how this was found. I mean, they've got a picture of him up there with his metal detector. They're saying this was found by a responsible metal detectorist. The British Museum are, are brilliant. For your name to be attached to what you've found is, is part and parcel of that time you've spent doing it. But this was on council land too. Just so unfair. In Farnham, news from historian Robin Bush. I've come across something rather exciting and I think it'd be a good idea if you got in touch with me as soon as possible. We meet Robin again at the Cathedral Library in Winchester, where he's conducted part of his research. Hello there. Hello. Hi, folks. Hello. Moment of truth. <laughs> Ian. Hello, again, Robin. Hello, Ian. I think you have a reason to be pardonably excited about something I've come across. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds you good. thought it could have been the Bishop of Winchester. I did. I think I have another very, very likely candidate. You come this way. Go on, round you get. I can't avoid this being theatrical, <laughs> no, by the very nature sure. of the thing. Yes, I agree. But this is the most likely owner of your jewel. Yes, believe it. It's, it's flabbergasting. That's brilliant. It's not merely the question that your jewel is virtually identical to those that you can see in his hat there, and indeed a hat that was one of his favourite pieces of costume because he's regularly depicted in it. Right. It's because he was at Farnham on a regular basis. <coughs> right. There's it gets more. better. He can prove it. <laughs> I've been right the way through the series of these volumes, the Letters and Papers, Foreign and Domestic of Henry VIII. It's about 40 volumes of them. Mm. And on at least nine occasions, Henry VIII came to Farnham. Now, the other important thing is that Henry went hunting every day of his life, virtually. So you've got a situation where he would probably be riding in that park anything up to nine hours a day. We've already established that this is a rich, a rich jewel, only owned by someone extremely wealthy. Yeah. 
And Henry is the most persistent visitor to the Bishop of Winchester at Farnham that we can come across. If it's Henry VIII, I just can't believe it. I find it staggering. This is one of the very few occasions when you can actually, as far as possible, tie a particular piece of jewellery to a particular monarch. Uh, other than rings. We've got a few Saxon kings' rings that we know who they belong to. But this is a jewel which almost certainly belonged to one of the most famous monarchs of England. And that's a link which is very, very rare. And it's thanks to Ian Fletcher that we can make that link. I can't think of anyone else we've got to thank. <laughs> can you? <laughs> Ian isn't the only person to strike gold in Farnham Park. We meet local detecting enthusiast Bernie Hunter in a nearby pond. I'm hearing something here. That's it, yeah. What's that? Is that your foot? No. <laughs> <laughs> Put your foot there and there's... The flake is on the bottom of your sole. <laughs> Bernie's made a number of finds in Farnham Park. Till now, he's always reported them. It's like a penny. It's an old penny, isn't it? George the Sixth. Fifth. Fifth. Can't see the date. Hear <laughs> oh. your heart out. I'm going to. That, yeah. And another hat pin. Small hat pin. <laughs> yeah. Has it, has it got a sapphire in it? No, moment? it's uh, chuck it back, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> you need a dead. You only want the one with the sapphire in it. So do I have to give this to the council if I find something? Oh, yeah. yeah. You do. Well, I wouldn't. You wouldn't. No. <laughs> but you used to. You used to hand uh, everything in, yeah. didn't you? Not no more though. What? Because of what happened to him? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Certainly. That's pretty sad, That's isn't it? Moment. I would on farmer's ground, but not for Wavy Council. You wouldn't hand it in no, now? No, no, no. So what's happened to him has changed your attitude, has oh, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, certainly. A big change of heart then for Bernie. Meanwhile, the council are giving us the runaround over a request to film the duel. On the line, the deputy chief executive. Oh, hello there. I'm Joe Leyburn. I'm working on the programme with Ian Fletcher. Hello, the man who found the duel. You know, you know all about this. Um, well, you know we're really, really keen to film Ian looking at the jewel that he found. And uh, I just wondered, you know, the, is that going to happen? Can that happen? Can we film it in the museum? We can film the jewel, but we can't film Ian looking at it. What, your security problems? What, you're worried he's going to nick it or something? It does look a bit like you're picking on Ian if you're saying he's the chap who's got to wait outside. You're not picking on Ian. It's not personal. And you're not, you, I mean, at the moment, as I understand it, you don't want to do an interview with us either, is that right? You won't put the leader up to do an interview or anything. That's the situation at the moment. All right, OK, well, thank you for your trouble. All right. Seems a bit weird, but thank you. Not what we wanted, but I'm off to the museum without the man who found its most precious exhibit. Oh, hello there. Aha, uh -huh. you can see that. And it doesn't actually mention Ian Fletcher's name. Why is that? Why do you not have his name there? Well, we don't have anybody's names of, you know, any of the people who have given any of the objects or who they be belong to or if they're on loan or whatever. I mean, the British Museum We does just that. don't. I mean, we were in the British Museum and they'd got a... Well, it's just a policy. We never have. We never have had, you know, th there's no names on anything, so... And the other thing that I know upsets Ian is that he wasn't invited to the unveiling ceremony. Did, uh, did you think of calling him down to that? Or did the council think of calling him down to that? I don't, don't say you were involved in it. I mean, I don't have his address. I, it never even occurred to me. Uh, just so you're Dear. aware, I mean, that is Ian there. That's the man who found well, the jewel. Would you like to come in? I mean, why is he peeping through the door? Well, you, I think <laughs> the council have said he's not allowed no, in. The council no, have said that I can look at the jewel, not. but he's not allowed in. That's you'd, you'd ridiculous. Be, uh, this is would be great really nice, absurd. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you. It is totally absurd. But these were the conditions that the council no, imposed upon us. they were not us. the conditions no, that the council imposed. So Ian can come in now, can he? Terrific. Ian, you can come in. Come, they're saying you can come in. They've changed their mind. Come through. Well, it's a bit uh, strange, isn't it? Well, this is much better. This is better. Much, yes. And you sure? I mean, I don't want to get you in trouble. Sure. Why were we right. told that he couldn't come in? I don't know who told you that, but anyway, I was... Well, it was the deputy authorized. chief executive. Yes, what a beautiful pen. Heartache. All the heartache is cost. I don't think they will ever get anything quite as beautiful as that. It's absolutely magnificent. What that I could find that again. 
It's terribly sad what's happened to Ian, isn't it? <clears throat> if you would like an interview, I'd like to recontact the council and we couldn't arrange something else. We'd well, I'm contacting the council now. I'm saying we'd really like an interview. It's the least you can do. This man's whole life has changed. Give us an interview. We'd love one. Since Waverley Council are supposed to represent the people of Farnham, we decide to ask their views on Ian's treatment. You oh, you've done out a lot of money there, brother, haven't you? Yes, I would. I'd set some people on, I would. <laughs> if you have the honesty to hand in something you found, you shouldn't have to go to court no. and pay the cost. Well, yes, I thought you ought to be allowed to keep it, and I thought it was very unfair that you, you won in the first instance, didn't you? We did indeed. And then yes. you had to go, to the then they took court. you to appeal. Yes. I felt it was very, it was all wrong. I mean, they should be chuffed that you found something of historical, historical significance, you know, not charge you for it. It's ridiculous. It is. How do you feel about your council? Well, I don't know. They're little tin gods, aren't they, really? Little Hitlers. The council are still refusing our request for a meeting, still saying what happened to Ian was just policy, nothing personal. But Ian wants a chance to meet them face to face. Good evening. Uh, if I could just interrupt for a moment. I'm Joe Leyburn from Channel 4 Television. This is Hi, Ian Fletcher. Fletcher. He's the man who found the jewel in Farnham Park. Can interrupt. Uh, no, we can interrupt. Is, can I just, can I just tell you for a moment? If I, could just, if I could just finish. No, no, I don't think you this can. man I'd just like to say that I am I Ian Fletcher like and I am flesh and blood like you. And I just want to know why you are ruining my life, why you want my house. Will, will you, you not hear this man? House. Will you not listen to him? The people of Farnham who we have spoken to, most of them say they would like you to waive the costs that you were charging him. It's the council who are hard-hearted. Why are you being so hard-hearted? Why do you want to ruin my life? You want us to leave? Is that the problem? Yes, I like it. Yeah. All right, we'll leave. There's no need to be violent. OK, thank, thank you. you. No need to push. We'll leave. They're just petty little politicians who think they're obviously very clever, very powerful, and I'm just a little man smash into the floor. A little bit of good news that you might want to hear this evening. The Metal Detectors Traders Association, you've heard of them, yeah. so moved are they by what's happened to you that they're going to have a major rally, a real big rally this year, and they're going to put some of the funds that they get from that rally towards paying off these costs. What do you make of that? Well, it's unbelievable, isn't it? More decent people. These are decent people. Oh, God, I'm really moved by that. Ringwald in Kent, the biggest detecting rally of the year. Now, you're not entirely sure what's going on here, are you? No. I think I am. What these people are looking for are four lucky tokens like this one, which are buried somewhere in this field. Right. And the people who find them will then get the chance to win something really special, which is the replica of your jewel, which we've been using in the filming. Brilliant. And that's a lovely find at the end of the day for anybody to have, because the mock jewel is beautiful. It's nice, isn't it? It is. Really nice. Really nice, and made of real sapphire and 18 karat gold. After eight hard hours of detecting, the tokens have all been found and our finalists are ready for the playoff. So the field's been slimmed down to four. Now they're looking for the big one. Great. He's still looking in that one area. He's not moved. He's got a very sensitive machine, this boy, hasn't he? He must have, because he, he's, he's finding... hearing everything, isn't he? He is. Not quite like finding the real thing, but still a thrill for Peter Fillingham, a landscape gardener from Mansfield. He looks like I did when I found it. <laughs> Very happy. The rally raised two and a half thousand pounds, enough to cover Ian's interest payments for two years. He still hopes that when the good people of Farnham see this programme, they'll press their council to waive his debt and thank him properly for the treasure he unearthed for them. Next week, the man who put his life savings into a fishing boat that turned out to be a death trap. Joe Public returns at the earlier time of 7.15 here on 4.